uh, we're going to start even though a number of people will be coming in. Um, hi, everyone. I am Michael Lardner from the Marxist Education Project. And this is the first day of our uh, hosting for the third year in a row a series of events based on the release of a new socialist register, something we all wait for every time a year is about to change. And um, today we are hosting, we hope for people, but uh, Greg Albo and, and Simon, I hope I pronounced your last name correctly, Simon Mulhan and Samir Santi are here for their essays that were are in the book. Uh, I'd like to make a couple quick announcements. We're getting off to a bit of a late start. <laughs> Saturday, Anitra Nelson uh, will be here in the afternoon to talk about her new book on Yon Money, a post-capitalist strategy. It's a new Pluto book that is next uh, um, Saturday. On March 12th, we have Gina Apostle, the author of Insurrecto, a novel some of you may have read, but uh, it's really a, a, a great novel and covers the Philippines from 1898 through today with all kinds of, of perspectives on what has taken place there. It's a tremendous novel. She will be in discussion with Patricia McManus, uh, uh, from Brighton in the UK, and that event will be on um, on March 12th. Uh, then a week after that, Marcello Musto and Michael Hart will be visiting the MEP for a talk on Marx's writings on alienation. Right after that, we have our second episode of Socialist Register, the day after that talk. So come back one month from now, March 20th. Uh, we're already about 10 minutes after the hour, so I'm going to uh, uh, turn the floor over to editor, uh, long-term editor of uh, Socialist Register, a great comrade, Greg Albo, to introduce the series and today's panel. Greg, the Zoom floor is yours. Hey, thank you, uh, Michael. Uh, thanks to the Marxist Education Project, uh, Michael, uh, David Worley for hosting and putting it together. Uh, this has been a lot of fun doing the volumes uh, uh, with the MEP. Uh, we usually kind of the MEP's done some things and then Leo or I would drop in or, or one of our, our, our call, other colleagues drop into the sessions in New York. Uh, but we're stuck doing it at Zoom. I guess the good part of Zoom is then we can record it and send it around <laughs> further uh, and uh, uh, after this, uh, so thank you very much. Um, this volume is the last one coming out under mm -hmm. uh, under uh, with Leo's name as co-editor. Uh, his sudden death uh, a little over a year ago um, remains a shock uh, to many of us, uh, to me personally. Um, we were kind of just a few months before he died. Uh, we were kind of uh, having lunch together and kind of planning out the next five and ten years uh, and of different projects we thought would be good, uh, you know, political ones in the city here in Toronto, and uh, it was a range of kind of other projects we'd like to take on. So we were kind of doing some planning. Um, so it was really kind of difficult to lose them and, uh, and, and lose somebody that we, you know, that I'd worked with uh, for a long time since a graduate student. Uh, we put out, I don't know, about 20 books together, and endless kinds of political statements and so forth, uh, you know, seminars, workshops. <laughs> it was a kind of constant interaction, uh, along with, of course, our comrade uh, Sam Gindin uh, over the years, uh, you know, and, uh, and overlapping with uh, a range of stuff with his work at, in the, with the auto workers in Canada. Um, so it was a bit disorienting uh, uh, putting this volume together uh losing leo uh just as we were kickstarting we had commissioned uh most of it uh we had kind of set out a, a framework what we want to do we just had a few essays that we were going to fit in uh we communicated with most of the authors uh and then he was gone uh i was lucky enough to have uh to, to be able to work with colin lee's 
on the volume. Colin is was of course a, a key collaborator uh, with Leo on some of his uh, uh, important books on um, on British Labour Party, uh, and also uh, uh, also was a co-editor with Leo for a number of years. Uh, I've known Colin going back to when I was a graduate student, and we had worked together on in the in the 80s on editing the Canadian Socialist Journal Studies in Political Economy. So he was a friend, uh, but I kind of never worked with him since he kind of, he left Canada in retirement back to England. And we never kind of worked so closely together. So it was, it was kind of a real privilege to work with him. You know, this old, you know, as we always used to joke, this old Oxford Don, which he was for a period with, you know, all his uh, uh, his uh, capabilities in in uh, English grammar and, and and all the rest of it, and uh, you know, be me being a the, more of a self taught working class kid from Winnipeg, kind of trying to keep up with uh, with him was uh, a little bit intimidating at times. But uh, you know, we've been you know we're friends and colleagues, and certainly shame, share the same political perspective over things. So that was uh, a joy in the kind of sadness over uh, losing uh, Leo. Um, the conception of this, uh, this volume uh, was really, uh, the way we, had, Leo and I had conceived it was really thinking and reflecting over a longer term work that we'd done over, over, a, over, a, over a decade or so. Uh, and thinking about the kind of, po- wanting to put the perspective on, on the polarizations that everybody was talking about in this longer term perspective uh, that we had been doing and in kind of the conception we had of these five-year plans that we had been working with. Uh, so from, you know, the, in the middle of the great financial crisis, what we worked on in terms of, 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 read, of, of a couple of volumes on the crisis itself and reading the consequences for class structures and, and, and political organization uh, from the crisis uh, with a key thesis uh, that we had of a new phase opening up, uh, 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 a new phase opening up, uh, but with neoliberalism not swept to the side, uh, the working class remaining uh, after the crisis, uh, the, the main part of the crisis was broken, still disorganized, they're still fighting back in all kinds of ways. And the surprising thing, which certainly caught most conventional economists, uh, uh, by surprise, since they've been predicting the op- op- opposite, that uh, austerity, neoliberal austerity, uh, maintained its hold on uh, general economic policy of the state. Um, and as a result, the social and political displacements that had been occurring over the period of neoliberalism were still in place uh, and, and now even, sh- even, even, uh, even sharper. The second group of, of kind of thinking that we had done in terms of volumes was to try and think about this crisis uh, and the, what I, uh, the great financial crisis and what had come out of it in terms of a longer term perspective on, on socialist politics uh, in this phase of capitalism uh, and particularly kind of the resilience uh, that capitalism had showing and kind of, you know, returning uh, its grip and to re- recovering to, to a great extent uh, and finding a, 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 a path to renewal, it seems. Um, we did a number of volumes on rethinking revolution, rethinking democracy, uh, a world turned upside down. And what I think we were particularly pleased with uh, was a volume on the politics of the right. Um, what we were pleased with it is everybody was initially, when we were putting together, everybody had their doubts about it. <laughs> and questioning why we were spending so much time wanting to put something so systematic together on kind of a global survey of the new politics of the far right that had been emerging. Uh, but as it occurred, uh, Trump did walk into power just the, the year that we uh, had put out that volume. So in fact, it ended up looking quite prescient and occurs in, in terms of the politics that had continued. Uh, 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 very important. And that was provided, kind of those volumes provided a, a second kind of theme that we wanted to bring out. Uh, that is the need to rethink socialist organization and strategy in the context of political polarization uh, that was in fact especially seen by I Trump. To go to the email thing, but it, I think it'd be worth it if there are people who want to. 
Okay, <laughs> sorry. Uh, uh, the polarization that I've been occurring, especially in light of, of Trump in the U.S. And, and that giving further momentum to the forces of the hard, uh, hard right uh, everywhere in the world. Um, these themes framed the volume uh, and gave it some focus that we wanted to have. And this kind of next group of volumes we wanted to uh, take on was to look at the political conjuncture in depth around a series of key issues as we had seen it. Uh, so one was just the kind of the forms of market dystopia after this long period of neoliberalism. Uh, and where were the struggles for new ways of living in that context? Uh, similarly on a volume on digital capitalism. Uh, and then this volume itself uh, on, uh, on uh, new polarizations and old contradictions. Uh, obviously, the discussion of polarizations for a number of years now seems to have been everywhere. Uh, income and wealth, uh, social media, uh, the manic prom promises of the gig economy against the dystopias of actual lives in the gig economy, uh, the continuing spread of hard right movements, uh, more militarism, particularly kind of with this new phase of militarism that we're facing now with the the new, the new development of uh, new technologies around ICBMs and the main military powers all developing and extending those capacities, uh, vaccine apartheid, and so on. Um, and, you know, this aspect, you know, of a polarization existing in everyday life, uh, we all know, and uh, in Canada the, and around the world has spread the, the, the 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 freedom convoy as it was called the truckers protests that have kind of locked up uh, ottawa for a few weeks now and some of the border crossings between canada and the u.s is an example of kind of this spread of, of polarization in, in multiple forms uh a, a theme that i didn't mention yet uh, in terms of the political of, of over these volumes was of course that this was also represented as a crisis of centrism uh, and centrism were meaning not only kind of the, 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 the liberal party variations in, in Canada and the U.S. and a few other places, but particularly also a crisis of social democracy. Uh, since social democracy embraced the third way uh, in the mid-1990s, uh, it has been more or less rudderless in, in its political direction. It's been pretty much systematically losing votes. Uh, and it is uh, a, a key signal, a key other signal of the kind of the polarization uh, that has existed. Uh, so that was kind of at the heart of what we wanted to, wanted to focus on. So picking up on some of these older themes. Uh, I would like to just quote from the commissioning letter that uh, Leo and I drafted uh, for the volume uh, and uh, give the uh, mandate to the contributors uh, to help them frame their thinking. Um, Leo and I had drafted it. Uh, I, I guess it was, uh, you know, a, uh, more than a summer ago, two summers ago. Um, and here's what we wrote to the contributors. With the word polarization now on the lips of commentators on the left, as well as mainstream journalists everywhere, we feel, we feel it is the responsibility for the register to undertake a deeper analysis of the current political and economic a moment by addressing the underlying social contradictions that are producing these polarizations. It is one of the great ironies of our time that just two decades after capitalism became the singular global mode of production, as capitalist accumulation and social, relation, social relations finally penetrated every corner of the earth over 150 years after the Communist Manifesto predicted this, that polarization of politics, income and wealth, gross consumption along abysmal poverty of ecological destruction are there for all to see. Uh, as Leo was wont uh, to do, uh, he often found, uh, you know, a, a literary kind of reference to guide us in our thinking as we were kind of planning out the volumes and, and, uh, and uh, uh, trying to uh, keep our, our focus on what we were working uh, on. Uh, he pulled out a quote from, uh, uh, um, uh, a novel from uh, uh, Philip Roth uh, on, the, uh, on the, the central personality of the novel, Mickey Sabbath, uh, in the novel Sabbath Theater. And uh, the notion is this is the, what he was commenting, what Roth was commenting in terms of Sabbath was also a characteristic of 
21st century capitalism. Uh, uh, Roth wrote, what's clinically denoted by the word bipolarity is something puny. Imagine rather a multitudinous intensity of polarities, polarities piled shamelessly upon polarities, polarities to comprise not a company of players, but the single existence, the theater of one, the theater of one being the, the central dominance of capitalism at this historical moment. And that is what we kind of wanted the essays to take on, that uh, the, the sense of these polarizations in multiple forms and multiple spaces across many issues and the challenges that are posed for the left. And we wanted to explain uh, and push uh, the contributors to uh, take on the explanation of these polarizations uh, as they exist uh, on the, on, on, as, a, as, as part of the essential conflicts of capitalism these days in terms of the older contradictions uh, that have existed across capitalism and place them in that context. And that is why in the preface, we went back and drew upon Marx to pick up some of those themes. Uh, in the Communist Manifesto, uh, of course, there's the, the, the famous comment by uh, uh, Marx and Engels, the more or less open civil war raging within society up to the point where the war breaks out into revolution, open revolution and lays the foundation for the sway of the proletariat. Even more, or as famous is, of course, the, the, the chapter uh, on the general law of capitalist accumulation <clears throat> in volume one of Capital, <clears throat> where Marx uh, 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 draws upon the imagery as follows. The greater the social wealth, the functioning capital, the extent and energy of its growth, and therefore also the greater the absolute mass of the proletariat and the productivity of its labor, the greater is the industrial reserve army. Accumulation of wealth at one pole is therefore at the same time the accumulation of misery, the torment of labor, slavery, ignorance, brutalization at the opposite pole, i.e. on the side of the class that produces its, its own product as capital. This theme uh, was uh, what we wanted to kind of capture in the volume uh, and, and, and to capture kind of the contradictions it involves as kind of the uh, as these antagonists become part of, of, of the systematic uh, part of, of reproduction in every more complex and Baroque forms, uh, the, the constant mediation of the capitalist state between these conflicts. Um, and that is also why we kind of pulled uh, the quote from the working day, the famous quote from the working day on, on volume one, uh, where Marx is particularly raising the mediating role of the state in dealing with class conflicts. And there, Marx writes, the capitalist maintains his rights as a, as a purchaser when he tries to make the working day as long as possible, and when possible to make two working days out of one. On the other hand, the worker maintains his right as a seller, and, and when he wishes to reduce the working day to a particular normal length between equal rights, force decides. Uh, and that is kind of the kind of the theoretical sense of contradictions that we wanted the essays also also to draw out uh, the new polarizations, you know, running uh, uh, the new polarizations arising from the actual struggles and divisions of contemporary capitalism. And as these polarizations deepen in these class conflicts, this is kind of the what we're seeing uh, and bring that kind of assessment to the volume. We structured the volume uh, to, uh, around a series of, of, of issues, uh, uh, places, and then the question of kind of left alternatives in that context. Uh, the issues, of course, were partly around, uh, which we'll hear shortly from, was Simon Mahone on, on income polarizations, uh, Walden Bellow on, on China and the U.S., uh, Inger Salte on the hard right and historical hard right and uh, the historical forms of polarization that have occurred uh, from uh, uh, the initial forms of fascism to the new forms of the hard right today. Um, uh, in terms of places, we wanted to kind of capture a series of locations where uh, these polarizations seem particular prominent, uh, Brazil, South Africa, India, Russia, Germany, and Central Europe. And of course, uh, the U.S. Uh, with a with I think a series of outstanding essays exploring kind of the polarizations in the U.S. 
uh, under uh, uh, before Trump and after Trump, uh, after Trump as well, and the strategies opposed for the left. The third thing was in, was in terms of, of alternatives uh, and where the left is. Uh, perhaps, uh, you know, to some extent ca captured best in the title that's in Sam Gindin's essays on the pol polarized options uh, that face the left in, in, in finding an exit out of this crisis, uh, taken up further by uh, Sam Eric Gendeshi on looking at uh, the disputes in identity politics versus u universalism, also by uh, David Harvey. And in the interview and dialogue between uh, uh, Hillary Wainwright and James Schneider over uh, the uh, over uh, Corbyn in the UK. So that is uh, the volume as it was structured. Um, and uh, I, I'm very pleased with how it came together. I think it's kind of uh, remains one of the few systematic attempts to theorize and, and, and map out the different forms of political polarization at this moment. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Simon and, and Samir. Uh, we didn't talk about which one will go first, but maybe it pro probably Simon's essay is such a marvelous account of uh, income and wealth polarization. It, uh, we wanted to leave the volume with it uh, since it kind of lays out that terrain so wonderfully. So we'll probably begin with Simon. Uh, and Simon is now Professor of Emeritus of political economy at Queen's uh, Mary University in, in London. Um, I don't think uh, Walden managed to make it, so we'll then turn to Samir. Samir is now work, has worked as a longtime union organizer in the U.S. and is now at the School of Labor and Urban Studies at the City University of New York. Okay, so then we'll turn to Samir after Simon. So Simon, uh, introduce everybody to your marvelous essay. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you very much. Can you, can you hear me? Good. Um, I, um, I was very flattered to be asked to, to write this essay, and I'm not sure I really fulfilled the brief adequately, but anyway, I did my best. I'm going to try and share my screen so that, um, hang on a moment, there we go. There, is that okay? Can you see that? Good. Okay. So, um, what I've done in this essay is, is try to pull out some of the themes that are in the chapter. I haven't really addressed all of them because there isn't really time in a short presentation to do that. So, I've, I've tried to pull out the ones that I think perhaps are the most, the most important, and um, well, we'll see how that goes. So first of all, this is just a very quick description, and this is very familiar, I'm sure, to everyone in the, who's here listening. They just a list of the main characteristics of the neoliberal era, an era I would guess you, you'd think started more or less around 1980 and continues in um, one form or another. So the first one I, I just want to mention is financialization. This is a word that is banded around a lot. And I'm just going to say what I mean by it here. I, I'm going to say rather more about this in, later on in these slides, but the increasing weight or dominance of finance. And let's, let's just leave it at that for the moment. Secondly, deregulation. Thirdly, privatization. Then there are cuts in, or rather reforms, in inverted commas, of the welfare state in one form or another, healthcare, social care, education, housing, and so on. Similarly, so-called reforms of institutions of the labor movement, generating increasing insecurity of employment. And then globalization. And from the perspective of developed capitalism, relatively well-paid jobs in the manufacturing and export sectors have been offshored, moved overseas, to typically to lower wage economies, which has led to an employment shift towards the lower skilled service sector, generally much less well paid, much more insecure than the jobs that have vanished, together with wage stagnation for large portions of the metropolitan working class. Now all that I think is familiar. And I'm not gonna dwell on any of this except 
for the two items in red, financialization and globalization. And I want to say rather more about each of these two. Globalization, first of all. And all that I'm going to mean by this is really something, a process that in, has involved a very large increase in the world's working class. Um, one might think of the absorption of China into the world market after 1978, the absorption of Russia and Eastern Europe into the world market after the end of the decade of the 1980s, and more generally the penetration of market relations throughout the globe especially in most of South and Southeast Asia, Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, Nigeria, and so on. In fact, the, the list is pretty endless. Now, why is this important? Well, because large increases in the world's working class entail large increases in the production of value and surplus value. Now, that's clearly a very sort of abstract statement, a statement at the, the level of high theory pretty much, of sort of rather elementary um, proposition that follows straight from the labour theory of value, the bigger the working class, the more value and surplus value is produced. And that's, I, I, what I want to do then is to jump to a much, much, much more concrete phenomenon which is that a major manifestation of this increase in world surplus value has been the rising income share of the top 1% of households. Now, I present quite a lot of data about this in the chapter, and I'm not going to repeat that here. Just to say that if we eliminate inflation, so we measure at constant prices, and we look at the 30 countries that I list in the chapter, which comprise around 75% of world national income. And we compare what they received in 2019 compared with what they received in the mid-1980s. They're getting, collectively, an extra $11.6 trillion dollars. And that's more than four and a half times the entire 2019 national income of the UK. So one's talking about a huge shift of resource to the top 1%. Okay, well, apart from the obvious rather extravagant luxury consumption that we read about, what do they do with their money? Okay. Yeah, of course, they're the private jets, the houses here, there and everywhere, the sports franchises, the football teams and so on. But what do they do apart from this with their money? OK, well, typically they invest it. And these investments are either direct investments, that is, you know, literally factories, production processes and so on or their portfolio investments, investments in stocks and shares, in property and so on, via fund managers. And some of this will be kept in cash. Now, if we jump now to the existence of these cash pools, they have risen from about $100 billion in 1990 to, in 2010, which is the latest date I have a figure for, about three and a half trillion dollars. And about two thirds of this, this, these, two thirds of this cash is run by asset management companies, and most of the rest is corporations investing on their own account. So there is a lot of money. But what's not often recognized is that this is a problem. And the way to think about this is. Suppose I were to give you a billion dollars. What would you do with it? You want to keep it safe. You don't want inflation to whittle it away. And let's suppose you want to keep it liquid. You always want access to it. So you could say, I'll keep it under the bed. But that's not going to protect you against inflation. You could purchase, I suppose, the safest sort of paper asset, U.S. Treasuries. They're guaranteed by the US government, so they're as safe as the US government is, but actually there's not enough of them. 
Countries, particularly in South and East Asia, hold enormous stocks of U.S. treasuries in their central banks, partly because they don't want, they want a cushion against the sort of for, foreign currency speculative crises that they ran into in the late 1990s. So there's a huge amount of U.S. treasuries that aren't in the market at all, They're held in foreign central banks. You could purchase, I suppose, short-term corporate debt, in more technically called commercial paper. But that's not guaranteed by anybody. That's far too risky. You could deposit it in a bank. But the sums are too big and banks are too few to spread these balances in insured increments. So again, that's too risky. So the answer is, what do you do if you have a lot of money like this? You find some instruments secured by private sector collateral, which ensures both safety and a rate of return. And the really pretty much the only instrument that does this is called repo, a sale and repurchase agreement. I'll say a little bit more about this. What's the size of the repo market? Well, it's bigger than the US banking system. Okay, so it's not a small market. Second thing to say is you and I don't have any access to it because it's a wholesale market. Okay. How does it work? Well, if you've got a lot of cash, how it works is you purchase an asset for, let's say, I don't know, X dollars, a sum of money from a counterparty, a bank, say. But you arrange simultaneously to sell that asset back to the bank the next day or in a, over a very short time period for slightly more money, Y dollars, let's say. So this Y minus X over X, so the selling price minus the purchase price divided by the purchase price is called the repo rate. And it's analogous to an interest rate on a bank deposit. The other thing to note is that the amount of the deposit, the X dollars, tends to be less than the value of the collateral asset. The difference is called the haircut. Um, anyway, that's just how it works. And if either party defaults, the other party keeps the collateral, if that's what they've purchased, or the cash, if that's what they've sold the collateral for, depending on which side of the market you are. So what happens to the cash? It's deposited in short and very short term repo deals against asset collateral. And it's safe as long as the asset collateral is safe. Just as an aside, what happened in the great financial crisis was the asset collateral were extremely complicated constructions of bonds that in the end turned out to be not safe at all because they depended upon mortgage repayments ultimately in a collapsing housing market. Okay, so the cash is deposited in short and very short term repo deals against asset collateral. But then we can ask the question, well, what is this asset collateral? What does that mean? Where does it come from? Okay, well, now we go to US banking. We know in the 1930s that banking collapses led to regulation, there were entry restrictions, interest rate ceilings, and all of this went to protect profits. It was loosely said that in the 1950s, 1960s, for example, banks operated according to the 363 rule. That is, take in deposits at 3%, lend them out at 6%, be on the golf course at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. But at the end of the 1970s through the 1980s, bank profitability came under pressure. And it came under pressure on both sides of the bank's balance sheets. On their asset side, the loans that they were making, what happened was that firms started to bypass banks and enter capital and money markets directly to borrow money. And this financed a huge wave of mergers in the of mergers and acquisitions activity in the 1980s, leverage buyouts and so on. But basically, firms 
stopped going to banks and went into the markets directly to lend money. That was on the sort of medium term loan, short term loans. Again, firms did the same thing. They stopped borrowing from banks, bank overdrafts, and they went into the what became known as the commercial paper market, the short term corporate debt market. So banks were losing loan business. They were also losing deposits business because unregulated money market mutual funds began to take an enormous amount of bank business. Well, what's the result? If you have a, an industry that is losing profitability, capital exits the industry for more profitable, unregulated bank-like activities. And commercial banking itself was restructured in order to compete more effectively. Now, this is something that in general Marxists are familiar with. Capitalist labor processes are continually transformed by specialization through extensions of the division of labor in order to pursue productivity gains. And this happened in finance. The traditional loan making process was broken into separate parts and each part became a separate market operation. And this involved creating new intermediaries specializing in these component activities. The whole process is summarized in the word securitization. Basically, any debt that generates a regular flow of repayments, so for example, credit card receivables, mortgages, auto loans, student loans, those are the four biggest, biggest um, classifications, you can transform those regular flows into a capital asset and trade it as a bond. And that's essentially what happened. In a traditional loan, if a bank makes some, uh, if a bank lends money for a mortgage, it will hold that mortgage on its books for 30 years or as long as the debt is until maturity. It will be a bank asset. That doesn't happen today. What, happened, what happens is the loans are securitized and sold on. In through a variety of financial intermediaries, which I'm not going to go into, in a sequential multi-stage process. You might have heard some of the words before, loan origination, warehousing, pooling and structuring, warehousing again, pooling and structuring into collateralized debt obligations, marketing and so on. Um, it's an extremely complicated process and it employs lots of people. And money market borrowing is crucial to each stage. In fact, each stage is financing longer term loans with shorter term deposits. And that's characteristic of banking or if outside regulation, then shadow banking. Just to give an example, money market mutual funds take in deposits from the public. OK, these deposits you can get at pretty much on demand. You can get your money out again on demand. What does the money market mutual fund do with the money? It purchases short term corporate debt in the commercial paper market. The money market mutual fund makes its money on the difference between the interest it receives on the corporate debt and the interest it pays out to its depositors. But notice that the depositors can get their money immediately. The short term commercial debt the, the asset, if you like, of, of the money market mutual fund is a term debt, you know, a month, two months or something like that. So this is characteristic of banking. And if outside of the regulatory processes, it has come to be called shadow banking. So I asked the question, where does the where did the asset collateral come from? Where does it come from? It comes from the securitization process, that is, <laughs> from debt repayments capitalized into a bond. Okay, so what I mean by financialization is not the growing weight of finance in the economy. It's, it's basically the construction of a market where on the one side, you have the growing demand for asset collateral or bonds coming from the growth in the income shares of the top 1% ultimately. 
So that's on one side of the market. And on the other side of the market, the growing supply of bonds via securitization of flows of debt repayments. And this obviously then involves um, a quite um, sophisticated social system in which debt is encouraged because debt can be securitized and sold on. Or equivalently, that's looking at the bond side, the demand for bonds and the supply of bonds. Or we can look at the supply of cash via the increase in top incomes and the growing demand for cash from levered, that is indebted financial institutions and an indebted household sector. It's these processes that I think are at the heart of financialization. Okay, I'm gonna skip that slide, it's just. So what are the future? Well, we know in principle, in general, that the accumulation of capital tends to destroy the conditions of its own existence, generating a divergence between the long-term interests of the capitalist class and short-term individual profitability. Generates economic restructuring, which is required to support renewal. And, but it's a process, it often also requires political intervention. So two examples. One is the increasing indifference of multinational corporations to the conditions of reproduction of national working classes. For example, Apple, take Apple, it's a multinational corporation. What interest does Apple have in the social reproduction of the US working class, for example? So that's one, one example. The other example is the problem of climate change, the result of past capital accumulation, which has paid no regard whatsoever to its effects on the physical environment. Well, as regards the first example, globalized capital still does in fact require a working class and so cannot in fact make itself independent of the conditions of social reproduction, even though it thinks it can. And as regards the second example, issues around climate change have to be resolved if capitalism is to survive at all. So how do these two issues, how are these two things playing out at the moment? They're playing out as national political pressures for sort of Keynesian expansionism combined, at least in declining countries, with an aggressive social conservatism. And the particular balance of the two depends upon particular recent national histories. But there is clearly an urgent need for viable labor movement strategies to confront globalization and financialization, especially in the context of climate change. And I think you asked me for 15 to 20 minutes. There you go. That's, that's my, my, um, my talk, my introduction. Thank you. Excellent. Oops. Thank you, Simon. Thank you very much. Uh, that was quite a, a, a great presentation. And everyone, we are recording. And if you request a recording, Simon's presentation with the visuals will be part of that recording. So, Greg, uh, we go now to to uh, Samir. To Samir now. Thank you, uh, Samir. Uh, Samir has a wonderful essay on his volume on uh, on Biden Biden uh, agenda. Uh, so. Somebody has their uh, mic open, so should close it. Uh, I, I don't know who it is, but somebody does. Uh, Samir, we'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you. Um, thanks so much, everyone. Thanks for inviting me uh, to be here, Michael, and and all of you. Um, and Could you just speak up just a slight bit more, Samir? Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Is everyone able to hear? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, and and I I ought to say before I get started. Um, Greg, uh, Greg and Colin did, you know, just a heroic job pulling this volume together under some of the, you know, the most nightmarish possible circumstances. Actually, the, the last email I received from Leo ever was asking for this piece. And so it'll always have, you know, a place in my heart as 
a really important one. Um, uh, so I guess I, I, I don't um, have a PowerPoint. I, I, it's a, that's set a high bar, Simon. That was an excellent, really great presentation. I, I think it, though it, it nicely, I think, kind of sets the context in which um, the stuff that I wrote about um, took place. So I'll use that as a, as a jumping off point. I mean, you know, Leo and Greg, when they, they asked me to, to, and this was, I guess, in the fall of summer, summer to fall of 2020, um, to write a piece on, you know, the, the U.S. labor after, or, you know, who know in the future. Uh, it, it was like written with the fingers crossed, you know, U.S. labor after Trump, fingers crossed, but, you know, whatever that really means. And it was in the midst of the pandemic, it was before the vaccines. And so it was quite difficult to really think stuff through. And, and, I, and I learned, and I really gained an admiration for the, the registers editors and past writers who I, you know, I grew up on the register, but I never quite appreciated the challenge of writing a piece in that's going to come out, you know, eight months or a year from when you're writing it, when everything is so fluid as everything always is. But I mean, in, in the uh, winter of 2021, it was really fluid. Um, so I tried to, I tried to just, you know, use what the Biden administration was saying as, as a starting point. Um, and, and again, to try to analyze, you know, what the, or really to raise some questions about what the prospects um, were for revitalization of a labor movement in, you know, in the U.S. in the coming years. Um, some of this is, you know, I mean, it was an interesting time to be re asking the question because Biden, you know, even from some of the uh, unsuc uh, you know, corners of the left of the labor movement that you wouldn't expect were getting was getting a little bit of praise early on, um, in you know March April of 2021, around his his statements, some of the policy initiatives that he was at least proposing. He put out a tweet, you know, encouraging you know the Amazon workers in Alabama who were organizing um, at a warehouse in, in you know outside Birmingham, Alabama, which would have been the first Amazon warehouse in the U.S. to successfully unionize. And and it was like who you know I mean Biden, we all know who Joe Biden is, and so there were there was a lot of kind of curiosity and head scratching at what was going on and whether whether this was actually you know someone who was you know <laughs> what what to make of this. Um, and among other things, actually, you know, one of the first things that he did in, in week, you know, in the, it, a, a month or two into, into his term was, was assign a task force to look into strategies that the federal government could use to encourage union organizing. And it's very explicit. It's quite an extraordinary document to read. The, the preface of it poses the, the challenge facing, you know, the new administration is not, not, not how to, not how to tolerate unionism, but how to actively encourage unionism. And to ha have that coming from a, an administration like this was, was quite striking. The report just came out the other day, and it's, it's, you know, not all that profound. So, you know, I mean, we can kind of see how much things have shifted. But, but, the, but, I mean, I guess the long and the short of it is I was trying to understand what to make of all of this. And so, you know, in addition to the unionization commitments that the administration was expressing, there was also a fairly significant departure from recent, you know, recent history in terms of the proposals for public investment that they were outlining. Um, the American Rescue Plan, as you know, as they called it, it was a kind of the COVID plan with some two, two and a half trillion dollars in April. And they were they put forward this big, you know, um, public infrastructure plan, of course, which many of you, I'm sure, Followed the fate of, and so you know, from the outset, it was quite clear that one of the obstacles of all this is going to be, um, you know, the Democratic Party and the United States Senate, and that's proven to be the case, right? And the Biden administration's largely founded on those predictable um, obstacles. But I also wanted to interrogate the question of, you know, what were the conditions that were making this supposedly ambitious vision? possible? To what extent was it ambitious um, at all? Um, and what might some of the, you know, what, to what extent could we anticipate um, obstacles that would emerge? Um, so the second one, you know, the second one that I raise, you know, I mean, obviously, there's the Senate, obviously, there's the, the, the sort of the U.S. the configuration of U.S. politics in a federalist system, um, which we have, we have this institution that is, that is, designed to obstruct reforms and has for, you know, the entire, you know, 
the entirety of this country's existence. The other one was the politics of inflation and to what extent were a renewed politics of inflation going to, going to serve to obstruct the administration's, as, as, as Simon you know, put it, the expansionary Keynesian ambitions that the administration was outlining. Um, and I, I, I tried to raise this question and, 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 you know, and to look at the recent development of finance in the U.S., and the political activity of finance in the U.S. and the extent to which, I mean, again, and this is drawing, I think, largely on or connecting largely to what Simon was talking about, the growth of the asset management industry vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, say, the traditional investment banking industry and its incorporation in the administration and what that would look like. And so to put a you know, proper noun on this, this is just, you know, BlackRock, right? The, 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 the firm BlackRock, which now, I think it now hit, it recently hit $10 trillion in assets under management, right? This, it, it, whereas in 2015, it had something like two or $3 trillion in assets under management. It's incredible growth of an asset management industry. There's a few others, but BlackRock's the most, most well-known. And that's penetrated the Democratic Party, top to bottom. Whereas in the Obama administration, Goldman Sachs was kind of the face of the Treasury and the face of economic policy. Now it's BlackRock. And, and you know, what's the significance of this? And BlackRock, in the summer of 2020, is putting out reports, essentially advocating for a expansionary Keynesian policy enabled by significant monetary support from the central bank and implicitly and explicitly at different times expressing a, a sort of <laughs> tolerance if not preference for inflation and and this is this seems new in 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 sort of the you know recent political economic history right i mean I'm the pillar of modern finance expressing in in a to, you know a tolerance for for inflation now of course this is wound up with the growth of, you know, the, I mean, you know, the sort of the corollary of what Simon was, was discussing is the, the extraordinary asset bubbles, asset price inflations that have become central to financial sector profitability, which have always been central to a degree to financial sector profitability, but certainly since 2008, right, in the reconfiguration of, of monetary policy and the after, aftermath of the financial crisis. So I guess the question that I was trying to, you know, or, or you know, one of the questions to pose, and I, and, you know, I don't want to, I mean, I don't want to talk too long because I really would love to hear just a discussion about all of this um, with all of us, but is to what extent um, is, to what extent was the condition of expansionary Keynesianism that the Biden administration was proposing, to what extent was and is that contingent upon a tolerance from the asset management industry for a certain level of inflation? To what extent is this tolerance of inflation coming from the new commanding heights of finance contingent upon a presumption that the absence of inflation over the last few decades is going to persist and that that absence of inflation over the past few decades was grounded in the weakness of the U.S. working class dating back to the defeat of the working class after the Volcker shocks of the 1970s. Um, and so we can talk, I mean, I can unpack some of this, but I'm trying to like pose in, I suppose, in, in very, as quickly as I can, some of the bigger questions that were animating the essay. Now, since that point, we've seen, and, and I think, I mean, it's almost more interesting to talk about what has changed and what hasn't changed over the last year. Since that year, we've seen in the politics of inflation renew in the U.S. and around the world. We've seen central banks struggle to come to make sense of what's going on. Um, and we've seen an increasing hawkishness from certainly from the right and even from within sort of the usual suspects of, of liberalism in the United States. In many ways, you know, the, you know, Senator Joe Manchin, who is the, the sort of crucial senator in Biden's um, party, publicly, his, his rationale for, for, for driving, you know, the death, the nail into the coffin of, of Biden's economic policy plan, the Build Back Better initiative, was the specter of inflation, right? So inflation has already come to haunt the Biden administration's plans. But at the same time, BlackRock is continuing to express an aversion to 
a reorientation of central bank policy around inflationary anxiety. As recently as a couple of weeks ago, BlackRock executives are in the Financial Times taking to the financial press around advancing an argument that the Fed must resist acting too strongly, too quickly, um, and, and the Fed ought to understand the current inflation as not a, not a demand side inflation, but a supply side one that isn't going to be rectified through monetary austerity. And, and so it's striking. You know, I mean, there's the, the language that BlackRock's executives are using in the financial press. I mean, they're saying explicitly, this is not the time for a Volcker moment, a Volcker, Volcker style action from the Federal Reserve, Paul Volcker being the Federal Reserve chair in the 1970s, who took very, very strong measures to combat the inflation of the 1970s, raising interest rates to 20% and creating a recession that, that resulted in you know, the shuttering of many manufacturing facilities, really breaking the back of industrial unionism in the United States right in the, in the early 1980s, and offensive against the working class in the 70s. We have financial elites today arguing very explicitly against a resort to such a program. At the same time, the Federal Reserve led by Jerome Powell, who had been working closely with Biden around coordinating monetary policy with Biden's fiscal ambitions, right? The expansionary Keynesian ambitions that, that Biden was preparing pivoted sharply in the fall away from the accommodationist, easy money approach he'd been, he'd been supporting to a, to a more restrictive approach. And the moment he did it was the moment when wage returns came out. Strong wage report in October and November of 2021. And, and, and Jerome Powell, the head of the Federal Reserve, on a dime, effectively, pivots towards a more restrictive approach to monetary policy. So I guess the big, what we're seeing here is in real time, the playing out of what, what you know, Kolechki once called the, the political business cycle, right? To what extent does, does, do the conditions um, for even even something even something as as uh, what was you know as kind of orthodox as just an expansionary Keynesian policy? To what extent is that conditional upon a weak working class? And to what extent is is you know is is that is the rug going to get pulled out the moment there's even the slightest threat that that's no longer the case. So I don't know, I'm not, it's kind of a, I, I, I wish I had had outlined this as, as tightly as Simon had, but I just wanted to lay out some of these big questions. I suspect people have a lot of thoughts on this and I don't have answers. I mean, I just like, I'm trying to think this through myself. So I'm curious to hear what everyone thinks about all of this. And I would love to discuss Simon's piece as well. So that's all I got. Thank you, Samir, very good. So we're, we're now in our uh, discussion and Q&A period. I put in chat to write the word stack there. If you don't, then raise your hand with that icon. I'll try to keep everyone in sequence, but we are open to questions, comments right now. So. Greg. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, maybe just for uh, 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 to widen up the discussion from Simon's uh, uh, presentation a little bit, I was wondering if he could just kind of draw out uh, some of the distinctions he has with uh, the the two figures that have been particularly known uh, today about writing about income distribution, uh, Branko Milanovic and uh, Thomas Piketty and that group, and your own kind of very differences with their approach when you put so much more emphasis on on uh, on uh, the asset uh, uh, the asset concentration um, versus you know some of their positions and uh, uh, also kind of the program that uh, uh, that they've been linked to particularly to some extent the great em emphasis that they've had on the global wealth tax which was parallel to what came out of the Cornwall consensus of the G20 uh, last summer. Uh, so just if you could kind of uh, maybe elaborate a little bit more for uh, uh, your, some of your interpretive differences from uh, them. Okay, thanks. Um, 
I think the maybe maybe one way to to think about this is um, what does one mean by the capitalist class? That is to say, uh, we talk about the this shift in income distribution right at the very top of the income distribution. This this growth of income going to the top one percent so for the u.s i think it's around something like is it about 19 percent of national income now goes to the top one percent of, of households um i haven't got the figures actually to hand but something of that order um is this what is this by this one percent are we talking about the capitalist class are, are, is, is that you know is, is that is that if you like the I don't know the what should we call it the enemy <laughs> rather crudely and I've, I've thought quite a lot about this because one of the one of the things that I like to do is is to be empirical in a sort of theoretically grounded way and I'm interested in what one means by the capitalist class and the evidence produced in particular by Piketty is that this is actually very problematic to talk in those terms because most of the people who earn a great deal of money and so are situated within this top 1% have a labor contract and work for the living, they're not living off unearned income or non-labor income in any sense. So I was interested in trying to think, well, what does one mean by the capitalist class? It's clearly not a sort of 19th century class of rentiers, and it's not a 19th century type vision of the owner occupier of a of a firm, the owner manager of a, of a small cotton mill or something like that. And the way in which I tried to think about it was in terms of, well, what's the classical Marxist definition of the working class? It's, it's people who have to sell their labor power in order to gain access to consumer goods. They have to sell their labor power. They, they've no alternative. They have no or not enough non-labor income to survive. They need to work. The problem with the, let's say, the top executives of Apple, for instance, is they also work. They also sell their labor power. They have a labor contract. So... In what sense might we think of them as capitalists? And, and what I decided to do em empirically was to try to define capitalists as those who did have enough not to work, did have enough non-labor income not to work, but nevertheless chose to work. Because that's true of, of, of most people. It's true of the senior executives of Apple. It's true of the senior executives of BlackRock. You know, they, and to therefore sort of to see whether that could be a sensible dividing line and to call those who in principle, to call those who had sufficient labor income not to have to work, even if they did work, to call them capitalists. And I experimented quite a lot with the data for this and decided in the end that it didn't really work because you've got major sports stars who fit into this category or surgeons or entertainers or Hollywood film stars. I mean, these are some very, very, very rich people too. And one would, one would be rather hesitant about talking about them in, as members of the capitalist class. They're just extremely wealthy individuals. And so in the end, I, I decided that 
that the top 1% are essentially a, a, a proxy for the capitalist class. One can rather loosely talk about the capitalist class in, to, in terms of this top 1%, but it's a mistake to identify the people as themselves as, as capitalists. It's, capital is a social relation and it's really where you are with respect to that relation that matters. Now, the problem, if you, if you ask me, well, how does this relate to Brankovic and Piketty and so on, is that the trouble is they don't talk in these terms. And so it's difficult to make exact comparisons. I mean, what, what I did uh, in some work I allude to in the essay and reference in one of the notes is I looked at the US income distribution and asked the question year by year by year, how much if we, if we divide as a cutoff point the amount of non-labor income you needed in order not to have to sell your labor power for a, a labor income, even if you did so, what percentage of the income distribution did that take? What do you think is better for me, some popcorn and, or a few pretzels? What do you think? What? what do you think is better for me, popcorn or a few pretzels? Sorry, is, is somebody non not somebody's not muted. Um, and what this turned out to be is in in, in the late 1970s, <sighs> 1980, this would be about 0.7 okay. of, of the of the sorry 0.7 percent of the household distribution of income. Um, and in 2007, it, was, it had risen to about 2.3%, but it tended to fluctuate through time around 1%. So in that sense, I think it's meaningful to talk of the 1% as a proxy for the capitalist class, but it's, it's, it's not very exact. And um, what I think the, the big, um, what I like about both Milankovic and, and Piketty is that they're taking the question seriously. They're looking at income distribution in a way that it hasn't really been looked at for a very long time. And all sorts of work in this area should be encouraged because they tend to expose how divided our society is. I don't know if that really answers your question, Greg, but I mean, that's a stab at it. But I kind of wanted you to elaborate that section of the <laughs> of the essay a little bit too, to kind of a, where people are kind of debating. So yeah, it certainly opens up the uh, uh, space for picking up further things on it. Thank you. We have uh, David Worley is on uh, a, cha a stack. Um, so go ahead, David. Uh You have a Thanks all for your uh, very good presentations and your great. I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? Your connection is a little testy, David. Oh, uh, sorry about that. Uh, I wanted to follow up on I, I, Simon's uh, uh, yeah discussion about uh, class uh, identif identification of the capitalist class uh, was very provoking to me. I mean. To me, this has always been one of the most vexing aspects of Marxism has been the definitions and identifications of, you know, what are these classes that we're talking about that are struggling and how do we, how do we define the, I, I did want to take exception a little bit to your, uh, to the idea that the, these, the 1% are living somehow off their, their, because they're working, and of course they're working, I mean, that's how they got to be where they are, but also they're, those jobs are jobs of great power and prestige and influence. I mean, who wouldn't want to have one of them? But I don't think they, as, I don't know if we want to say that they live off their salaries because as came out recently in, a, a, in the United States when it's spending, well, why, don't, why doesn't Jeff Bezos actually pay any taxes well, because his income from his job isn't that much. He doesn't take a very big salary relative to 
you know, his wealth. And what comes out is all these people, this one percenters, if you want to call them, they don't, they live literally by borrowing for everything. That's why they don't pay any taxes. And, and people will lend them stuff, money to, for, to pay for everything because they know they're good for it. And so literally, they don't have very big salaries. They don't have very good salaries and they don't necessarily take a lot of dividends. They simply go to their bank and say, I need, you know, $500 million to buy this. And the bank says, yeah, here, just, uh, you know, pay it back when you get around to it. So in a sense, they are living, they are coupon clippers, even though it's not in the traditional way. That's... Uh, uh, Carol, you are the next person. Go ahead. Let me clear up my screen here. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, Speak close okay. to your computer, please. Uh, I'm, I'm actually speaking on this um, this headset. Is that it's not clear? There's echo. Uh, Is this any better? It's okay. Oh, I can't hear you. I'm sorry, I have this problem all the time. Uh, come back to me, I'll go try to get in a, another um, microphone. Okay, well, uh, Simon or Samir, did you yeah. want to, or uh, Greg, did you want to comment on David's uh, comment or? Carol, you're the only other person uh, who was asking a question just then. Yeah, I'll, I'll come back. Um, I think, David, there was a lot of echo, so I'm not completely sure I, I caught exactly what you were saying, but it seemed to be that these, uh, these extraordinarily wealthy people don't take, in fact, large labor incomes. Um, they 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 are just they are so asset rich that they can just go to the bank and say lend me some money and the bank says oh yes please or something like that um i think the if you look at certainly if you look at piketty's evidence um what he shows is that the increasing share of the top one percent is not due particularly to an increase in non-labor income. In, that is an increase in rent, interest, and profit. It's as much due to increases in their labor income as their non-labor income. And I think the, there's, a, there's a volume, isn't there? There's a biennial volume in the US called the State of Working America that comes out every two years and I think they they've always done a pretty good job in demonstrating the disparities of income within corporations of labor income within corporations certainly it's the case in Britain that the labor income of top executives has increased hugely compared with labor incomes further down the scale um, so I'm I'm not convinced that I'm 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 not sure that the evidence agrees with with your proposition about about Jeff Bezos that these people are just new fashioned coupon clippers. I'm not really sure that's right. But anyway, um, so that's that that's that's what I wanted to say. Carol, did you want to try again? Yes. Is this any better? It's a little better. Go ahead. Okay. Sorry. It's a constant ordeal. So I have a really worm's eye view of the economy. Um, uh, I worked for a financial publishing company that did ratings for 11 years. And I have an arts background and an English background, so I was a copy editor. And I had to read this stuff that, that for about American industries and check the facts and query them and 
you know, know there are all these kinds of um, non, you know, unproven assumptions and everything. I specifically remember um, the banking industry uh, publication where the uh, head analyst uh, blithely says, you know, the real estate market was going up and there was a lot since like 2002 about this. And I was like, well, what happens if the market crashes in a lot of different places around this, the country? Oh, that will never happen. <laughs> and, you know, and then some of the mistakes that, the mistakes that were made in the, the debt rating side of this company were, they almost took the, the economy down and so much of it was just, um, you know, people who are in the position to make these decisions and publish these pronouncements were never called. You know, after the after the um, the meltdown, the banking uh, analyst was promoted. Um, and as a lowly copy editor who's like actually reading and questioning them, you have your you have absolutely no impact. Um, it, it's almost it's resistant to any kind of even just you know, the basic uh, copy editing. So from my perspective, it's, it's a behemoth and there's, there's, no, <laughs> there's no way to intervene in this, at least from the inside. So, okay, Carol, uh, should we take another comment and then address both Carol and the next person? We have Sean on, on uh, stack. Go ahead, Sean. Sean? Hi, thank you. Um, so my questions um, were, uh, well, I had a few, a few questions about uh, how this, um, the analysis of uh, the current uh, situation with uh, capitalism how it can inform uh, the class struggle here in the United States and like identify where are the points. Um, I think of banking, you know, you've talked about banking and um, it's, it seems to me that the, you know, there's a couple of things out there about banking. Uh, you know, the, 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 the uh, removal of the glass Steagall, uh, even going back before that, I remember in 1975, basically the banks, uh, you know, Put the made uh, pushed New York City into bankruptcy, and it was like the onset of a whole era of of austerity and really uh, neoliberalism. It was like the beginning of neoliberalism, 1975, New York City. Um, the banks did that, and today, uh, you know, you talked about the um, Blackstone as having. A, Samir mentioned Blackstone, Black Rock. Sorry, Black Rock as being. A, you know, having inordinate influence in the Biden administration. And there was this conflict between, you know, whether or not inflation is the main, inflation is uh, sort of the main, should be the main target or, or not, or this Keynesian, um, you know, continue to fuel the economy uh, investment. So that was like that, that was the struggle. And I, 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 I guess I, I'm confused a little bit about when Marxists, um, you know, we're trying to, we want to understand what the capitalists are up to. We want to understand what motivates them, you know, and what Simon was talking about. We have to, under, we have to learn how to, you know, what's going on because we're sort of like in the dark. Uh, they're very clear. Their motive is to make money, right? And they're going ahead forward and that's what they're pursuing, right? So, but where does that leave labor? You know, I mean, what are the things that, uh, how can this understanding point uh, activists, point socialists to actually intervene at weak points? And, uh, you know, that's sort of what I lo was looking for in the conversation. I mean, I, you know, what do you think about public banking? Is that, a, is, that a, is that the class struggle? Is that a form of class struggle to take up public banking? Uh, you know, the resistance to austerity is, seems like it's okay in line with... Um, you know, all of the Biden plans, you know, the spending plans. But I mean, you know, so we can, you know, and a lot of leftists were, you know, cheering for the Biden plan. But I mean, in the back of my head, I said, isn't there something else that Marxists should be doing that socialists should be doing? Because, you know, you could say, oh, it's great that Biden, the Biden plan, well, was ruined by, by uh, 
by what's his name in West Virginia. But the Biden plan is going to hand money to people who are then are in turn going to hand the money to the banks because they everybody's in debt. So, you know, this this plan is just sort of like keeping the banking system afloat, keeping asset inflation continuing. Yeah, let's get back and speculating about I can see, you know, BlackRock. Let's get back speculating into uh, into asset prices and fuel the bubble again. You know, so it's I, I, I guess I'm, I'm confused about what this how this information can actually help us to intervene. Politically, yeah. Let's just shut thank up. You, thank you, Sean. And Greg's on stack uh, again. And then we'll take Carol, Sean, and Greg's uh, comments uh, with uh, uh, Simon and uh, Samir. So go ahead, Greg. So uh, I'm going to take advantage of uh, what Samir uh, uh, began with in his uh, great essay on uh, reading the U.S. conjuncture. Uh, around uh, uh, labor, but also kind of the shift in uh, the shift in uh, away from Trump, and basically ask also on his uh, on what he how he assesses what appears in different ways as the impasse of Biden e economics and kind of getting through Congress and all the rest of it and kind of the impasse and how he reads that at the moment, uh, which you were always cautious and uh, in, in the essay. Uh, uh, maybe, uh, uh, but maybe slightly bit more helpful on the labor side, and also you're reading at that. Uh, but you're particularly optimistic on the on the labor side, partly about the public goods struggle and and the, and the rebuilding of public infrastructure and a range of social provisioning that's been run down. But the the kind of more predominant uh, union campaigns have been around Amazon and maybe you could throw in Starbucks over the last uh, few months and how you're reading that aspect as well. Uh, you know, now that we're into the, into the Biden administration by a good bit, I think your essay wonderfully holds up. So don't, don't worry about that, <laughs> but I just want to kind of have you tease it out a bit, which you teased us with a bit at the beginning. And uh, now I really want to poke you on, uh, <laughs> on your future procrastinations. <laughs> Sure. Th thanks. Um, thanks, Greg and Sean. I, I, I hear you. I, I think it's I mean, that's kind of the million dollar question, right? Or that's the that's the only question that really matters. I, I mean, I think I mean, I guess I'll sort of just maybe loosely respond to both Sean and Greg together. Um, and, and and I think this also relates to Carol's point about kind of just like, you know, how this all this this whole irrational system works. Um, I mean, I think a, a central contradiction that we are that we're, we have to confront right now. Um, and it's one that's been in development for the last decade since, since the, the last crisis, is this curious alignment of at least immediate term interests between us and the, the asset manager capitalists. They, they, need, they need a persistent loose monetary policy for the sake of their speculative ambitions um, and anything but in this current moment um, a, a loose monetary policy poses tremendous threats to the working class. I mean a, a tightening up of things um, under such delicate conditions right now would likely lead to a, a, you know a, a recession and a, a surge in unemployment that would uh, you know be very, very painful to endure coming out of the pandemic. So this is a contradiction, right? And I don't know exactly how to answer it. And it's one that's thrown incredibly into relief by the resurgence of some measure of inflation, right? And 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 that I think as, as a left, we have to be clear, is affecting people in real ways. Um, the rising food prices, the rising gas prices, certainly the rising rental costs are affecting working class people all over the country. And this is a problem that we need to confront, but the tools traditionally used, at least in the last few decades, to confront it are adverse, you know, ad, work adversely towards the interest, towards our interests, and oddly towards the interests of the financial sector. But as long as we don't do anything about it, the financial sector is going to continue to speculate with this easy debt and, and inflate their asset bubbles to the point where we're staring at another collapse. So that's a contradiction that I, I don't, I don't know that we have you know, a short-term answer to. The long-term answer to is, as you say, I mean, public banking's a version of it. 
socialization of, of finance is really where we need to take this, right? Th imagining, you know, as Leo and Greg and Sam and others have long argued, thinking about finance as a public utility. What does it take to get there, right? That that's the that's the only real answer. And and you know, the New Deal banking reforms maybe are some you know precedent in this country for them. Postal banking maybe was some precedent for them in this country. But broadly speaking, as long as we have this profit-seeking financial sector. We're, we're in some trouble, right? So, but the question of how we get from here to there ultimately takes us back to the question of working class power, right? We don't have the power to do that right now. Um, and so we're forced into this contradiction. And that I think goes back to, goes to Greg's question of, you know, what is, what are the avenues forward right now? You know, I mean, again, the Biden administration, right, and lefties are cheering about the infrastructure plan, and certain left, certainly lefties were cheering about his, you know, the PRO Act, which was the, the, the labor law reform bill that the Biden administration unveiled. Certainly the most progressive labor legislation that we've seen laid out had no chance of passing, right, no chance at all of passing through a filibuster-proof Senate. Um, and so it's just, you know, it's just words on a piece of paper. In terms of the road forward, I mean, I don't know, right? This is what we're, this is what spaces like this are for, for us to think about and try to talk about and, and puzzle through. Um, it's, you know, in the piece, I, I try to make the case connecting, I try to make the, the, I try to make the connection between what I think have been some of the most encouraging struggles over the last decade or so with what some of, what seem to be the structural possibilities potentially enabled by Biden, Bidenomics's outlook. And that is a public goods approach, right? Organizing, trying to, trying to expand upon the struggles that teachers have led, that, that healthcare workers have led around expanding, you know, the common good type fights and connecting those to a broader political vision of decommodification, education, care work, so on. Um, and and that seems you know those are growth sectors there and climate change you can you can you can bring into this by all accounts those are those are going to be growth sectors with an aging population we're going to have a growing care sector it's either going to be low wage and immiserated or it's going to be you know dignified and that's a site of struggle climate change you know who knows what where this is going to go and the, and whether there's going to be policies directed towards it is itself a question of struggle but those jobs, insofar as they're created, are going to be immiserated or they're going to be decent. And that's going to be a question of struggle. So, you know, the, the short answer is not particularly satisfactory. It's one that we always come back to. It's about trying to build power in these areas. But I think to Greg's question, I, I don't know. I mean, it, it doesn't look very good. It doesn't look very promising um, in the U.S., Right now, there is there was a moment where it appeared as though an incoming administration with a majority in Congress and a, a sort of fortuitous constellation of ruling class interests aligned around it, right, large, namely, you know, this, this new financial class um, presented an opportunity. And, and it seemed like there may be something there, but that seems to be dead, right? That seems to be dead. And it's all... But, I mean, if anyone who's betting is going to, it would, would be wise to bet against the Democrats in November 22 coming up, which means that nothing's happening for the next two years and nothing's happening after that. And we're now left back in, you know, I mean, not that, not that we, you know, those of us who think about this, not that any Marxist should have put too much hope in a Biden administration and a Democratic Party in which Joe Manchin has veto power. But insofar as we did, that door seems to have closed. Um, the question I think that's maybe interesting to continue discussing is to what extent does that coalition that was cohering that maybe had some odd contradictory but no less real opportunities within it, to what extent is that a feature of the landscape going forward, barring, you know, a, a right wing authoritarian turn that shuts off all democratic possibilities? Is this is this part of the landscape in the next decade? And if so, can we think about how to how to exploit it? Um, but in the immediate term, it doesn't seem like there's much, m much in the way. And I think the right wing volume from a few years ago is probably one to revisit <laughs> over the next few months. Simon, do you have anything to add? Yeah, um, two, two things, a, a little bit disconnected, actually. Um, one is about 
interest rates. So you know, there, there's a lot of um, speculation in the press about what the Fed's going to do, what the Bank of England's going to do, and so on, and how quickly are they going to raise rates, and blah, 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 blah. And they, all the discussion is as though the Bank of England, the Fed, central banks more generally, have control over interest rates, that so they can choose what the interest rate is. Now, that's certainly true at the very short end of the market. But if you look at the time path of, in, for the US, for Germany, for Britain, for Japan, if you look at the time path of inflation-adjusted long-run interest rates, so let's say the interest rate on a 30-year treasury, for instance, adjusted for inflation, those interest rates have been falling from about the late 1980s. You know, not falling continually, there's sort of ups and downs, but generally falling to the very low levels that we see today. There are presumably economic forces at work that lie behind this, obviously. Why do people seem to think so unproblematically that those economic forces, whatever they are, have changed and that interest rates can just be jacked up? Is that right? In fact, it seems to me that there's, um, there's quite a lot of, is it wishful thinking? I'm not quite sure of the right words, but it's quite unclear to me that the future path of long run interest rates is going to be upward, despite what the commentators say in the press. It may well be that the Fed tries and the Bank of England try to raise short term interest rates, but they're talking about tiny percentages, tiny percentages. And you know, what will the short run interest rate be if prognostications are correct in a year's time? You know, maybe one, one percent higher than it is now. This is this in historical terms. This is really, really low. So I think I think there is an issue about interest rates that we need to confront. The second thing I wanted to say, which is a bit different, was more about what should socialists do? What should an appropriate strategy be from where, from where we are now? And we're, we're in a pretty weak place now. There's no doubt about that. But it does seem to me that there is a danger in assuming that capital is all-powerful and all-knowing and, and so on. It, it, I think that we have to... One of the previous speakers, I can't remember now who it was, talked about um, issues around decommodification. And certainly one of the things, one of the ways in which to interpret what neoliberalism has done to the labor market and to social welfare is about recommodifying areas of activity, and which is exactly the opposite of what the left want, wants to pursue. So it seems to me that anything that rebels to expand a space that is in opposition to market fundamentalism, however that market fundamentalism is expressed, is a good thing, something to be supported. Some, so we need to build spaces that challenge market fundamentalism and that create spheres in which we can say, hey, look, here's, here's a sort of, set of social relations, a society, I'm you know, not talking on a large scale here, in, in which we don't, we're not necessarily subordinate to the dictates of the market. We want to create struggles in which we are able to say, for example, taxation is a good thing. You know, it's taxation that funds the social provisions of education, healthcare, and so on, that, that make life worth living. And it, it's, I, I tend to see strategy in those sorts of terms. And in a, in a grander sense, I am aware that 
you know, that means, you know, I suppose in a US context, so I'm less, much less familiar about US politics and British politics, but I suppose that does mean in a US context, swinging behind any proposal that is expansionary, that um, takes back social insurance um, provisions of the state away from the private market, that, that, that does those, those sorts of things. And, you know, this isn't socialist revolution. This is just a sort of, I guess, a t an attempt to, or a series of attempts to try to, to try to create a different space from prevailing social ideology. And, you know, that seems to me to be a good thing. So I know it's a bit wishy-washy. It's undoubtedly reformist. It's, but, there isn't a lot of option at the moment. Um, I don't know if that helps. Okay, we have a comment to everyone in chat uh, from Jose, who says, I'm more concerned with pop left-wing fascism and Habermas critique which is now under the rhetorical manipulation of language and symbology of the wokeness culture, co-opted by the capitalist class, giving the people the false impression we are heading to some kind of social justice, equality, and equity, simply because we follow the new morality and canon of what stands for social <laughs> justice, which in reality, leaves everything untouched, unchanged. Uh, any comments on that? <laughs> Everybody wants to pass that one aside. We do have one essay in the volume that kind of picks up that theme in, uh, in a particular way from uh, Samir Gendeshi uh, uh, via the Frankfurt School and looking at the issues of... Uh, false concreteness versus universalism and kind of picks up kind of the way that uh, that the uh, discourse and and uh, um, and a range of identity politics is is, is a, a feature of this polarization at the moment uh, but I, I have another observation but maybe I should wait till after uh, Errol asks his question yeah go ahead Errol well, I find, I find a lot of this very confusing, partly because I'm not an expert in economics, and I don't quite understand why or where this sophisticated analysis of economics gets us in terms of changing the, the world that we live in so that we can have justice or some kind of uh, measure of social justice. Uh, so I guess my question is, how does this uh, you know, detailed analysis of the economy and whether or not uh, Joe Biden is better than Donald Trump or Trudeau is better than somebody else, et cetera, et cetera, where does that get us in terms of building a different society? One that isn't where we don't spend all of our time hoping that we can get a few more shekels from the, the big guys. I guess the other question that I wondered is in the whole discussion about the super rich, the 1% and so on, uh, does the realignment of uh, class within the, within the capitalist system in any way offer us an opportunity for building new alliances that can uh, you know, or short-term alliances with some of the uh, lesser capitalists, if you like, in order to start to, uh, you know, build something different. I'm not sure I put that very clearly, but that's the confusion that's in my head. Okay. Thanks, Errol. Uh, Simon, Samir, Greg? Would you like to comment? Maybe I'll make an observation to kind of throw it back at, uh, at Simon and uh, Samir a little bit. Uh, um, uh, I just, uh, uh, Simon was pointing out, uh, you know, it uh, uh, wouldn't take that much of interest rate incre increases to start tilting the yield curve and even inverting it given kind of the, 
the weakness in in uh, in in uh, the still low rates in, in long term bonds. Uh, but there also is such large uh, demands inside the financial market for regularization of interest rates. Uh, uh, and how do you kind of read that? Uh, uh, it seems to me there is a, there is a, a, a contradiction uh, inside the financial markets in around this, which is being expressed over, over, over interest rates and inflation at this moment. So what will be, you know, if inflation proves to even maybe not continue on and reproduce it, reproduce it for a very long time, but for a period, it, is, it seems to me a very deep contradiction inside the financial markets at this point in time. And the other actually is for Samir, which you began kind of speaking about, is is, it, is the impact of inflation at this moment. Uh, uh, unlike in the 1970s, where you know the moment of inflation was, was still caught within a relatively stronger working class movement, uh, the continual struggle to kind of maintain real wages in this moment, it, it isn't. So you're then worried immediately with the impact of, uh, of, 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 uh, of uh, inflation, particularly in, in key goods that are going into working class living standards, the impact on this and what it would mean for political polarization, since it seems to me if, there's, if we're not able to kind of at this point in time yet to turn it around in, in, in wage demands, uh, and particularly collective bargaining, uh, even with a, what is a relatively much tighter labor market at this point in time than most of us would have predicted, uh, how that will impact on the questions of political polarization that we're, that we're seeing and whether it will accentuate that. And, um, uh, so I think, uh, but to, to Errol's observation, I think all these essays in a sense are getting at actually your point. The two obstacles that are present in dealing with kind of alternatives are one is how do we break the hold of the 1%, which are particularly embedded in the financial capital and its forms today. And the other point is how do we begin reversing and reorganizing uh, uh, a working class to, uh, uh, to challenge for state power and, and be able to put forward new, you know, new political agendas. Uh, you know, unless we address that, those two components, uh, all the visions that are being put forward are kind of imaginary still. And I think, you know, Simon and Samir put it in practically and trying to find ways, particularly you know, along the lines you're mentioning in terms of, of, of struggles over, over social provisioning and, the, and, and, and public and uh, 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 decommodification or the, re the re renationalization of, 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 of a range of, of, of of components to the public sector that have been privatized as kind of the, the leverage points at the moment, if there are any uh, major ones, those are tend to be what they're, what, what's available. Samir, do you want to speak? Sure, or Simon, if you want to go, you can feel free. Um, I'd like to say a couple of things. One is, one is specifically to Errol that, that, yeah, I appreciate I appreciate the point you're making. I guess I would say that however sophisticated your struggle in whatever area, if you don't, if, if one doesn't understand how the system works, then you're unlikely to have very, very great success in changing it. Now it may be that understanding how it works you know it it may be that that i was too abstract for instance in in what i was saying and but i do i really do think you have to understand how the system works in order to be able to change it um but understanding how it works if you like is a necessary condition for um changing it but it's clearly not sufficient. Um, so I, I think the, the trouble with going down the path, Errol, that, that you seem to be saying, unless, unless I didn't understand it properly, is that it's, you seem to be saying it's sufficient. I know how the system works. It, it screws ordinary people and we need to change it. End of story. And I think that, you know, all that's true. But unless you understand how and why it is people get screwed, 
in in sort of in in detail one isn't likely to have much success in changing things I, I think that's what I would say the other thing I wanted to say which is rather different was picking up on something Greg said which is I didn't say anything about instabilities in in financial markets and and so on and I, I think I would I would just like to say some things which is that which is that financial markets are about betting. They're about betting on the future. And those bets can only be placed if different people are prepared to make different bets, because otherwise you, you wouldn't have a market at all. And not all those bets are gonna work. There's gonna be defaults eventually, and those defaults will have consequences because one person's one person's debt repayments or another person's income, for example. So financial systems are, I think, inherently unstable. And so however terrible the situation looks now, it's not static and it's, it's always in the process of changing. So I wouldn't necessarily be that pessimistic. I mean, for example, here's, here's a, the sort of, a, here's a typical contradiction. And that is that um, if there is this continued growth of the top 1% and they are continually flooding the market with cash that is seeking bonds to buy, let's, let's take the example of US treasuries, then that's going to put continual upward pressure on US Treasury bond prices and therefore downward pressure on interest rates. At the same time, yeah, of course banks would like interest rates to rise. Since they make a lot of money on interest rate differentials, the, the higher the, interest, the le general level of interest rates are, the more the opportunity to create interest rate differentials of which they can make money. But that, that sort of, if you like that, I don't know, what, what can you call it? Profit maximizing desire that interest rates generally be raised runs quite counter to what one of the consequences of the, the increasing income share of the 1%, which is putting downward pressure on interest rates. So, so the system isn't a stable system. There are plenty of contradictions within it. I didn't say anything about these in my talk, but um, I, I don't think I would be as pessimistic that we're confronting a sort of unchanging behemoth, I think was the word somebody used, that, that, we, that, we, that we can't get any purchase on at all. I, don't, I don't, just don't think that's true. So we should be seeing much more fights over interest rates internal to the capitalist class as opposed to uh, over this from what you're predicting because of not only the inversion of the yield curve but also the pressures that are just built into the structural inequalities that exist right now yeah i, th I think that's quite right yeah very interesting so uh, uh greg samir uh simon we have only a few minutes it would be great if each of you could uh, uh make a closing comment and i did put in the in the chat over here, what our next event is, which is uh, March 20th, and that's there for you to look at. But uh, it's been a very good presentation today. And as I stated before, the recording is here. Anyone who uh, would like to refer to what took place today, just write to info at marksedproject.org, and we will send uh, the recording to you. Uh, Greg, did you want to start the Oh, I'll, you're go after, I'll go wrap it up. I'll let Samir and Simon say anything else. I'd love to hear Samir on, a, on the question of kind of the contradictions over inflation and, and uh, working class politics in the U.S. right now, too. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll maybe wrap with that. I'll also say just kind of kind of in the spirit of Simon's response to Errol, I, I agree. I mean, I totally take the point, Errol. I think it's it's an important one always to raise kind of like the way in which we think about this and talk about this stuff um, to spell out like its actual relevance to struggle, day-to-day -day struggle. And I think the interest rate discussion is an interesting one because 
you know, I mean, I got, I first started getting interested in interest rates and just thinking about the late 1970s and early 1980s and the effects of those rising interest rates on working class communities. And then I was like, what, what are these things called? Why, like, why are these so, so important? You know, what's going on and how, in what way, you know, so they seem to be a weapon that can be used against the working class. And so, you know, but then to, to Simon's point, right, it's, it is a complicated story, right? There's, they're not, there's not just one interest rate. There's different kinds of interest rates depending on the time horizon you're talking about. And so understanding kind of the character of these things and the ways in which they can or can't be used and the contradictions within the ruling class and how they see them and want to use them is, 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 is important, but, but also, and, in, 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 you know, unless we can spell out exactly why, I, t- I totally hear you on that. And, and, I, and I think this, I guess, does relate to the inflation question today. Um, you know, I think, you know, my generation is one that, that has grown up in the aftermath of the 1970s. And, and, and I think you see it in the U.S., the, the, insofar as there is a resurgent left in the U.S. right now, um, the generational divide around the significance of this question. You see a lot of, I think, dismissal of the significance of this issue coming from sort of professional class leftists in, in the U.S. And I think that's a, I think that's a real problem. Um, you know, these prices do, uh, dispropor- the prices that are rising are disproportionately affecting working class people. Um, they're breeding resentment. They're breeding frustration. They're blamed on um the expansionary insofar as we've had expansionary policy, which, you know, over the last few years we have, they're blamed on that. They have, they threaten to um, undermine the potential for, you know, I think popular um, organizing around similar kinds of, of policies of the sort that Simon talked about in the years to come. So I think that there is a real urgent need to, to frame the discussion around inflation in a way that, that clarifies this. Unfortunately, I mean, there, there are limits to our power on, you know, to what we can do about it. And I think that's, that's the grave threat. Um, but, but I, I, to, I mean, and Greg, to your question, I, I think it's a real, I think this, even, even insofar as this doesn't turn into a long-term kind of wage price, but, you know, the working class way, we've seen a bit of wage growth, but it's lagging the prices, real wages, even after a year of tremendous growth and tremendous militancy in, in, you know, the recent history of the U S are, 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 are lagging prices over the last 12 months. Um, and, and I, I, I don't think that's a good, I don't think that's a good development for polarization or for, for the prospects, even of a, even of a, again, a kind of moderate liberal political um, progress over the next couple of years. But the question is, you know, what kind of power do we have to, to shift that in the immediate term? And here we are back to square one, always back to square one. Um, but thanks again. I appreciate it. This has been a fun discussion. Thank you very much, Samir. Uh, uh, Simon, did you want to say, uh, you, you made a really good statement at the uh, just before, but is there anything else you would like to add before we close out? I think, I think the, um, <clears throat> the material conditions of existence of the mass of the population, I, I hesitate to say the working class, because I think it's perhaps broader than that, are not, I think, in a, in a good place. And certainly in, British, in the British context, there's going to be a huge hit to living standards over the next six months. I mean, it's already starting, but energy prices in particular, while they're, very, they're quite regulated, people are going to experience roughly 25%, 30% increases in their bills from April onwards. There's tax rises scheduled to come into operation as well. And I think that, you know, with, with a, a, maybe this is a particularly British thing to say about the British context, that is, but with a, with a very reactionary government apparently committed to large levels of expenditure in levelling up regions of the economy, but at the same time, engaged in in essentially deflationary policies is is a situation which is pretty pretty unpleasant but it throws up a lot of opportunities for meaningful struggle in the months ahead and i would it wouldn't surprise me if something similar were true in the us today um the only other thing i would say i guess is that well first of all i'd like to thank you for inviting me 
Um, and my, Michael, I thought I could just send you the PDF of my slides and you could send them to anybody who asked you for them. That's great, Simon. And please send them to me at the same time. Uh, okay. When uh, Leo and I were mapping out the, out, at the volume, we kind of had uh, three key things that we wanted to make sure we covered. One was uh, the question of income and wealth polarization. Uh, the other seemed to reduce, it seemed impossible to do this volume without taking on uh, the question of China US rivalry and the geoeconomics and geopolitics involved. And the other was uh, the new Biden administration and whether, uh, uh, you know, this was providing a certain exit to the polarization in the lead capitalist state that had existed over the, the Trump period. Uh, we were very fortunate, in fact, that the three people who we had right on this topic uh, and were at the top of our list uh, uh, agreed. Uh, so we were so pleased when Simon said yes. You know, one of the uh, uh, most uh, influential senior Marxist economists, and I say senior in a very meaningful and positive way, <laughs> uh, in the in the sense of having a long time kind of uh, precision in his writing and elegance in his writing that kind of has influenced uh, a lot of us and kind of was dealing with income and wealth in a particularly unique and, and uniquely Marxist way, which was what we wanted. Uh, Walden, who couldn't uh, speak today, but hopefully we'll have him later, uh, was, you know, centered in the focus on the global south, uh, a, a major figure in the Philippines and seemed to be the purpose vantage point for looking at uh, the Chinese-U.S. rivalry from one of the uh, countries in the world most impacted on that and somebody who had been involved with this from his entire life uh, from his university career into the, in the U.S. to kind of going back to the Philippines and kind of an engagement this with every dimension that he covers in his essay from the economic and trade matters uh, to uh, the issues of, of uh, military deployments in, in the in the South in this China Sea. Uh, uh, and then we wanted somebody who, who could comment on on the Biden period that uh, that kind of crossed activism and intellectual work and uh, Samir uh, with both of the experiences uh, uh, exactly fit that. So we were really, really pleased. And you can see from these two presentations that we were right, <laughs> that we got the right people uh, uh, doing the right assessment for, for the volume. And I think uh, their essays are going to have some influence uh, for quite a while. Uh, Simon's already is in demand to be translated, though. There you go. <laughs> I'm sure Samir is too, too. And I, I know lots of our common friends keep uh, uh, with Samir keep touting how pleased they were to see his essay, and uh, the essay is kind of helping guide their thinking at the moment. So, uh, also for Samir, thank you very much, uh, Simon and Samir. Just too bad Walden couldn't be here today. Thank you, all three of you, for coming. And I want to remind everyone. The MEP is selling this book with shipping for less than the cover price. So just go on our site. And Fernwood is selling this book to Canadians. It's too expensive for us to mail this to Canada, but Fernwood is uh, distributing the book in Canada. And, and Merlin is doing it in the UK. Wherever any of you are from, get a copy of this book and read the essays we covered today, but the essays for next month. And... See you back here on March twentieth. We've got to keep uh, we've got to keep uh, uh, Errol's uh, uh, retirement income going in Victoria. So purchase, yes. uh, <laughs> purchase the volume here in Canada too. <laughs> and thank you everyone for coming today. It was great to see everybody, and uh, uh, it's great meeting you, Simon and 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 uh, Samir. Very good. Thank you. Thank you all.